Welcome, 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 family. Happy Sunday. Welcome back to Healing for the Culture. I am your host, Ivory Shields. And this, y'all know what it is. This is where we have uncomfortable conversations and we teach you the tools that you did not learn in school. The tools to heal, have better relationships, better businesses, better, better life all that good stuff. Welcome back, family. You are listening to iHeartRadio's ATLTalks.com. And happy Sunday. I said that already, but I'm going to say it again because it is truly a happy Sunday. It's I'm in Atlanta and it's nice and sunny and bright out. The rain is gone. Thank goodness for that. Although, I know that the rain is necessary, don't get me wrong. Without rain, there can't be flowers. I get it. But I tell you, I, I'm a sunshine girl. I love the sunshine. I love great weather. I love to be outside. So I'm really looking forward to being out in this beautiful sunshine today, feeding my melanin. Family, make sure that you do the same thing. Get out and feed your melanin today. Um, in this beautiful sunshine, if you're Atlanta, wherever you are, I know a lot of people are coming out of a, um, this, this cold, a lot of this winter weather, these winter storms that have been going on across the nation. Um, so if you're fortunate, <coughs> excuse me, to be in a, an area of the country where it's nice out, relish in it and enjoy it. Okay. Welcome, family, to episode 20. Woo! We made it to 20. Yay! Woohoo! Thank you to everyone who, ha who has been riding with Healing for the Culture since its inception. I'm grateful for you. I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. Um, words can't express how grateful I am for uh, the loyal folks who have been uh, with me since our very first episode. So I wanna make sure I let you know that I appreciate you beyond words. Captain Darrell is in the building today, in flying building. flying our plane per usual. How you feeling, Cap? It is a great, great day. It's a great it's day. It's a great day, it is, great Sunday. Yes, you had a good week? I did. Yes, okay. you, it was a great, great week. Big okay. things. All right. Major, major things taking place. I love it. Well, let me tell you, um, there are there there are a lot of things happening behind the scenes that is really that is really um, um, what is what's the word I'm trying to say? Um, making good things happen that is that is outward. For people. It's flourishing. It's flourishing. That's it. A lot of seeds are be, that yeah. have been planted um, are now reaping their harvest. It is. Yeah. Since I was 15. Since you were 15? Yes. <coughs> Y'all know Captain Daryl has really been in this radio game for a very long time. Since he was 15. 15. I was like, oh, I'm 15. Like 15 and how old are you now? 58. He's 58 and he does not look 58 either. 58. I just Jesus want to say Christ. that. What kind of, what's your skincare routine, Captain? Daryl? I have horrible skincare. No, you do candy, not. I got a packet full of candy I won't eat now. I got to stop. You know what I'm saying? Oh, my God. Horrible. Captain Daryl does something. No, I just put water in my face. No, I don't use soap in my face. I don't either. Okay, that might be, yeah, that no might soap. be a trick. Uh, no okay. soap. No soap. What else? That's it. There's got to be something else. Maybe it's just being, keeping a good positive attitude, too. No liquor. No li Oh, yes. No liquor, no smoking, no tobacco. I ain't nothing wrong with it. People do what they want to do. No judgment. No here. judgment at all. No. I just don't do it. No liquor, no alcohol. I, I see. I see what it does yeah. to people. Family members, but liquor, liquor will tear your skin up. It will. It tear your skin up. I agree. And smoking. It, it does. That does. Yeah. Liquor and smoke will tear your skin up. Both increase inflammation in your body. Inflammation leads to wrinkles. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> There you go, family. See, you never know what you're going to get on yeah. Healing for the Culture. You can heal though. for your skin. That is perfect. I never yeah. thought about that. It does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's real. Those are facts right there. Wow. 
So, okay, I love it. So, so now y'all know how to stay, how to stay looking youthful and young. <laughs> no Lay liquor, no smoking, alcohol. no soap on your face. <laughs> no smoking, lay off on the alcohol, no alcohol, and no soap on your face. Unless it's like a mild facial right. cleansing soap. Yeah, ladies are different. They wear yeah. makeup. Ladies, mm -hmm. different. they have to wear some kind of cleanser to cleanse their face. Right. You just go, go to old school. I do use every now and then take some alcohol. You know, when your mom was a kid. Okay. You take a little alcohol okay. and clean your neck off. You Green know. alcohol. Um, we, I got you. 99% alcohol. <laughs> Rub your neck. And I got some of that too. Rub your neck with some and alcohol. I remember when I was a kid, you know, I grew up in the hood. Yeah. Then I clean your mom's. I'm going to see if you were to watch, take yourself a bath. Let me, watch, let me get that white rag and put some alcohol on and clean your face. Put some alcohol on your face yes. every now and again, y'all. When you want a, a spring cleaning, okay? That's it. Don't do that every day, look. No, yeah. not every day. Spring cleaning, alcohol on your face. <laughs> so, I'm in the studio today. It's just me and Captain Daryl. Um, family, welcome. I am excited for my guest today oh my goodness this is going to be a I, I i don't know which word i want to use phenomenal fantastic insightful empowering inspiring um informative conversation today okay so so you if you're listening live um kudos to you you're gonna hear the replay as well on my youtube channel ivory shields um but Man, oh man, oh man, I am I excited to have this conversation today with uh, someone who has been in their field for several years, um, has counseled and coached many couples. Um, he's a minister, relationship coach, and I am so excited to welcome to the show today, Mr. Robert McKinney. Yay, good can morning, we get an applause? Can we get an applause? I am we're gonna give you your you know, your, applause, your, applause. your rightful due applause. Yeah, applause. Mr. McKinney. <laughs> yeah, applause. I am doing wonderful, brother. How are you? Welcome to the show. I'm great. I'm great. I'm great. Hey, you know you were talking about the weather. It was just I'm I'm here in Dallas and it was just last week that we were uh, starting that terrible winter snowstorm, and now a week later, it's sunshine and it's clear. And so, yes. uh, just a message for anybody that's going through anything right now: every storm eventually runs out of rain. We Ooh. just have to make it through. Ooh. Eventually, it's going to run out. Oh, did y'all hear that, Jewel? Already, we opening up the show with Jules. Okay. Yes, every storm eventually runs out of rain. I love mm -hmm. that. And we know after the rain comes sunshine. Yep. Shining yep. down on us. Good stuff. Illuminating goodness. Absolutely. Welcome, welcome to the show, uh, Gregory. Me. Absolutely. Um, go ahead and, and tell, fam tell the family who you are and what you do in your words. Sure. Uh, well, my name is again Gregory McKinney. I am I am a life and relationship coach and a licensed minister. Uh, I've worked with couples who are, of course, having issues in their marriage or if they're seriously dating. I, I do premarital counseling. Also, uh, part of what I do is to bring clarity to people. You know, it's not so much that you have a problem in life, but why do you have this problem? And so. Uh, beyond just discussing what the issues are, I like to help people find out what was the motivation for this behavior, what triggered this behavior, and how can now we change this behavior so that you can actually now have the life that you want. Uh, what I've been doing lately, however, is working with people who have experienced childhood trauma. You know, myself have experienced some childhood trauma, and I know what it's like to have that unhealthy weight on your back and uh, trying to carry this load and trying to present yourself as a healthy, strong person where it feels like you got a 100-pound backpack full of rocks on you. Mm. And so what I try to help people do is say, let go of that weight. Let go of that 100 pounds of extra weight that's mm. unnecessary. You're carrying things you weren't meant to carry. Ooh. If you let that weight go, I promise you, you can run much faster. Oh. So that's what I try to do with people. Oh, my goodness. We coming out the gate dropping jewels. Y'all better have a, a pen and notepad ready. That's all I have to say because we are coming out the gate dropping jewels on y'all. <laughs> and it's so funny that you say that because 
Mm -hmm. I kind of use I use that analogy often as well. You know, we we come here with our backpacks, right? And mm -hmm. throughout the and we come with our own. And, and when, when we come here, our backpacks are empty. Okay, mm -hmm. and throughout the years, we just accumulate stuff in our backpacks, stuff like you said that doesn't even belong to us, stuff that belongs to other people, other people's baggage, other people's guilt, other people's shame, other people's pain and hurt that they experienced. We put all of their stuff in our backpack and we get so heavy. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, to, and, and we think that we are soldiers. Mm -hmm. You know, we pat ourselves on the back because look at me, look at what I can endure. But all the while, we're walking around with this hump carrying mm. thing that belongs to our parents, that belongs to our spouse, that belongs to our kids, that belongs to our grandparents. That's not for you. Let that go. Mm. God didn't create you to carry someone else's weight. He created you to carry your own purpose. So let someone else's weight go so you can fulfill your purpose. Mm. And you get spiritual humpback. <laughs> Emotional and spiritual humpback from carrying yeah. everybody else's stuff. God doggy, you got to stand up nice and tall. You got to have a, a, a nice, tall, emotional and spiritual posture. And that only comes when you release everybody else's stuff. We, we, well, you know, I have found when I work with people that that is a big issue for people of identifying what's their stuff and what someone else is yeah. else stuff. You know, especially with parent issues, because we, as parents, tend to think every problem, every mistake our child has made, somehow we influence that. We're responsible for their decision. <coughs> like, no, no, your child is 35 years old. Mm. That's their decision. Yeah. That's not your responsibility. You don't have to carry that. And Ooh. so oftentimes understanding what's your stuff, what's someone else's stuff, is freeing in of itself. Yes, yes. Teach, 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 teach. Well, let's jump into it. I want to talk about, so if y'all haven't noticed, all of my guests this month for February have been men because I really wanted to highlight uh, men's, first of all, I wanted to highlight the the stories, the, the stories of trauma and overcoming trauma in black men. Also, I wanted to highlight um, love from a black man's perspective. So everybody in the month of February have been black men, all of my guests. Um, and that was on purpose. So let's jump into it first, talking about men. All right. Mm -hmm. And my mm -hmm. first question to you is, have you seen a, like this greater awareness among black men as it, as it relates to the importance of their mental and emotional well-being since the pandemic? You know, sis, yes, and I think it is a, a great thing. I think it's a wonderful thing. I think that that primarily has been because now men don't have a place to hide. Hmm. We got nowhere else to run. We can't blame it on the traffic. We can't blame it on wow. the issues that are going on in the office. We wow. are now face to face with ourselves, Ooh. our loved ones, our spouses, our children. And now because we are quarantined, we now have to deal with those demons that live with us from day to day. Mm. And so now that we can't point the finger at someone else, we have to now say, okay, what is it that I have to deal with? What is it that is bothering me? That is something I haven't fully gotten rid of that's keeping me stagnant from moving forward. And so I've seen a lot of men uh, approach therapy and counseling and coaching very uh, in a very tepid way in this season. Mm -hmm. uh, they they want to talk, but they don't know how to get the conversation started. Yeah. You know, because the, the number one go-to for men is, I'm good, I'm straight, yeah. I'm all right. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, instead of just saying, no, I'm hurting, yeah. I'm not well, I'm in pain. They, they want to say, I'm good, but I got this thing. And it's not it's, it, and it's, it, it's not a full yet awareness of, no, this is a struggle, it's just a thing. But I've seen men at least acknowledging, hey, I got a thing that I want to talk about, and that eventually leads to it developing to a full-fledged conversation, okay, this is my baggage, this is my trauma, and this is my struggle. 
And so, yeah, the pandemic has forced men to come face to face with themselves and really identify what the particular issues and struggles are. You know, you said something that really um, stood out to me when you said we can't, in particular for men, you can't blame it on traffic. <laughs> you can't blame it on the office. Man, that is so, so real. That's real yeah, so, stuff. Yeah. It's always this exterior, exterior thing that's the problem. Yeah. We are not the problem. It's the world. It's right. the world. It's everything else except right. us. It's, right. It's, it's, it's racism. It's economics. Right. It's whatever it is. But right. not acknowledging how has racism impacted you? How has that attacked your self-esteem? Why do you feel like you always got to overprove and overvalidate yourself in the workplace? Mm. Why do you go to work with a chip on your shoulder? That is an issue. And, and I think that racism is a form of trauma. And so let's talk about how that has landed on you, sir. One, ooh, Jules, I hope y'all got your notepads, 1,000%. And I do believe that, you know, that, that is a, that's a collective thing. And there is a process that we have to go through to heal from trauma, from racism. Yeah, yeah. I heard one person quit recently, they said, uh, racism is post-traumatic slave disorder. Yes, that's Dr. And Joy DeGruy, her book. Yeah, right, yeah. right. And so uh, we have to recognize that we're suffering from PTSD here, mm -hmm. that this is a generational thing because yes. slaves taught our grandparents, our grandparents taught our parents, and now uh, we're reflective of what slaves thought were best at the time. And so we have to heal those wounds and say, just because mama did it and grandmama did it doesn't mean it was right. I got to let go. And so one of the things that how that landed on men is that, especially in the black community, is uh, mama is that we're, we're careful not to judge our, our mothers. And so don't you say nothing bad about mama. Mm -hmm. You know, we're very protective of our mothers as we should. And our, and our, and our fathers too, but mothers get like a a certain position in our lives and so as men uh -huh. how do we relate to the people that may be injuring us when we were told not to disrespect them oh my goodness how do we have those healthy now conversations with my wife and with my daughter mm. when they are sometimes inflicting pain on me but i was taught and raised don't you disrespect your mama don't you disrespect oh, your wife and goodness. you need to protect your daughter oh. how do i protect myself Oh, that's so good. That yeah. is good stuff. That is, wow. That is so good. Yes, because that mm -hmm. is such a big thing in our community. And I don't think that people see that. Because and so it shows up in extreme. Yeah. And so you have a man that's very passive, who doesn't either say anything, doesn't acknowledge anything, lets everything slide. Or you have the opposite end of that pendulum where the man is overly aggressive and violent oh. at times. And if, and both men are unhealthy. They don't know how to properly manage their emotions. Oh, my goodness. They don't goodness. know how to effectively communicate in a way that is healthy for the relationship or themselves. That's so good. And, I, and, and to your point, I think a lot of black men struggle with that. And, and it leads me into my next question about the triggers. You know, like what what are some of the common um triggers that you see in men and i i have to, i would have to say that that would definitely be one these interactions and these experiences with their mothers that sort of triggers this this feeling of inadequacy or this feeling of um um what's the word um I, I think you're right, right on the right on the page. I am. I think the biggest trigger for men is the sign of weakness. Yes. And so when you've been emasculated by your mother, boy, don't you talk back to me? I will knock your head off. Who do you yeah. think I am? I ain't one of your little friends. You know, you grow up hearing that from the woman wow. who's supposed to be uh, the biggest nurturer in your life, and then mm. you grow up as a man, and you don't you 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 feel weak in the presence of sometimes mm. feminine energy. Because when a woman is uh, is strong in your presence, 
uh, you don't know what to do. You don't know how to meet her e as an oh. equal because dad didn't know how to meet her as equal. You don't have a template to say, how do I engage with my woman as an equal? So we share power. One person doesn't have to power, uh, overpower the other. We can be equal. We can be equally strong together. You can be strong and I can be strong. We don't have to have a dominant person here. And so I think one of the biggest <laughs> triggers for men was that when they feel like they're in a position of weakness, be it physically, financially, or emotionally, they tend to go back to their default setting, which is either passive or even uh, are overly aggressive. Mm. Wow. Yeah. That is so eye-opening for me, personally. Yeah. And I know I'm not yeah. the only one, especially a woman. I think women who are listening, oh my goodness, this is such great insight and valuable information um, because I, I, I don't, you know, we don't, we can't get inside of your minds and a lot of times we have our own stuff <laughs> that yeah. prevents yeah. us from, from being able to, to see um, things clearly and, 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 and for what they are. So yeah. that is such a great revelation and such valuable insight. Um, and even for men, too, I don't think men make the connection. Right, right. We all don't. come pre-programmed by our parents. Yeah. We think that when we are an adult that, you know, I don't live with my parents anymore. I'm making my own decisions. But you've already, you, you, your, you know, microchips inside your head have already been programmed by by someone else. Someone yeah. already told you how a man's supposed to talk, how he's supposed to walk, and what his responsibilities are, and what to expect from a woman. And so when you enter a relationship, although you think your parents are not influencing you, they still are. Yeah. And so we have to deal with some of this childhood experiences that we've been with and say, you know, keep the good and get rid of the bad and then create your own life. Uh, and, and, and you talked about triggers. I think it also stems a, a trigger is that it shows up because men focus on physical strength more than yeah. emotional strength. Mm -hmm. And so they tend to neglect the emotional strength and replace it with something else because they yeah. don't want to be weak. So if I make a lot of money, then I don't have to be all mushy and gushy because I'm paying the bills Then I get a pass if I'm not the most gentle guy in the world i'm not the most loving yeah. guy in the world because I'm, I'm taking you on trips and i'm buying you cars and i pay for this house and all this kind of thing so or or i got a six pack and i'm six foot five and i'm good looking so you should have you should be able to put up with whatever stuff or issues i have oh. because men tend to neglect their emotional strength and try to replace it with financial strength physical strength or status of some sort mm. Yeah. I know. We're, we're afraid. We're afraid. No, and and because as men growing up, and forgive me for going on my tangent here, uh, taking over. I let, I let you no. talk. It is your show. Mm -mm. Uh, but when men are emotional as boys, and oftentimes in the black community, it's met with violence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So True. when you see a little boy crying, it's like you know a pat on on the behind, like you know it's like boy, straighten up. You know, or or coach, you straight up be a man, suck it in. It's met with some type of of uh, of hostility or aggression. That's not acceptable. Don't do that. Whenever he kind of shows vulnerability or expresses some type of emotion, as boys, they're brought up not to deal with it. They're taught to get rid of it. Yeah. Mm, just get rid of it. Wow. And this is so good. And let me just say this, family. This conversation and the things that we're saying and the information and the insight is not to offend anyone. It's not to judge anyone. Family, we are in this together. This is about providing, this is about having, creating a safe space for us to, for us to have real, um, effective 
conversations and provide each other with tools and strategies to heal, to feel better, to have better relationships. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how much money you have, how many houses you have, how much stock you have, or how much money you have in the stock market, assets or whatever, at the end of the day, Things are not important. People are important. Your relationships with other people are important. So I just want to make sure that I let you know, family, that this is not to, again, offend or judge or put anyone down. All of this is to help. So I just want to make sure that I say that. Um, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm very, you know, I'm, I'm very witty. And so, you know, I may make jokes or whatever, but, um, this is, this stuff is important to me. This is serious stuff. And that's, that's one way that I approach things. I approach th things through, through laughing and, you know, and, and making light of things. But, um, but my, my genuine interest and my mission is for people to, to um, learn tools and skills um, to feel better, to heal. Because, you know, I, I, can, I can sit here and I can, and I can have these conversations and I can make jokes because I'm, I'm a person who's gone through it as well. And I'm on the other side, but I've been through it. So, so it's, it's certainly, you know, I'm not here to, to, to down talk on anyone, neither is Gregory. Um, we are definitely here to help. Yeah, and you're right, you got to laugh. Every time I'm talking yeah. to someone, I try to crack up a smile in some way, form or fashion. I tell the corniest dad jokes, but you got to, you got to laugh. What's life without laughter? Oh my goodness. I actually think, now, God didn't ask for my influence when writing the Bible, he wrote it without me. But <laughs> if he was to have asked me, I would probably have included a sense of humor as a spiritual gift. I yeah. tell you, if you can make someone laugh and smile, you are a blessing. Oh my goodness. People that can make me laugh and smile are, are angels on earth, in my opinion. That is I the truth. That. Seriously. I mean... La they, they say it's cliche but they say laughter is the best medicine laughter makes the heart lighter it laughter yeah. and and laughter creates laughter comes from joy and joy is a very high vibrational uh feeling and so it is very healing Absolutely. um Absolutely. i, I want to touch back on um the racism and and healing from racism and i just want to want to yeah. share in part um and i think i I, I can assert this when I say that it is possible to heal from that. Yeah. It is definitely, it, it is a, first of all, it's a thing. And it is a process that you, that we have to go through in order to heal from racism. And it is possible. I, I know because I've gone through it myself. I used to be someone who felt, um, who really felt, you know, very strongly, and I still feel strongly about racism, but I felt, um, uh, what, let me let me try to articulate myself. Um, a bit more militant. Back yes, in the yes. More Angela Davis. Yes, precisely. I was that person who felt very strongly about, you know, um, making sure that I'm that I'm. I guess I felt like white people, you know, were the enemy and things like that. And I really do think that that has so much to do with the trauma and not going through the healing process. And I know from going through my own healing process from that, I don't have that same perception and I don't have that same feeling. I really feel um, quite differently. I understand, yep. I understand our differences, but I understand that that white people are people also, and that they are people who have also been programmed. Just like black people have been programmed to believe that we are inferior, white people have been programmed to believe that they are superior. So yep. I do have an understanding now that we have all been programmed under this program with this faulty this faulty perception, this fault, faulty reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 there are two schools of thought. 
when it comes to dealing with racism. There is one school of thought that we can be healed from it, then there's another school of thought where we manage it. Healing mm -hmm. means that I'm so comfortable in myself, yeah. I'm so proud of who I am, that in the face of racism, I can still stand strong in my own identity. I don't feel mm -hmm. like I got to compromise or shrink in the presence of anybody. I fully yeah. embrace who I am yeah. and my heritage. Now living this together collectively, so how do we uh, embrace who we are, not to the detriment of someone else? And so I try to see people that uh, that my my light shining doesn't dim yours. Mm -hmm. You can be a full 100 watt bulb, and I can be a full 100 watt bulb. Mm -hmm. My shining doesn't impact yours. And so I think that applies to us as blacks as, as, as to whites as well. That we're all at the end of the day a child of God. That yeah. in heaven, God's not going to have a black section and a white section. We're all going to be there together. So let's try to promote equality and unity. But we do live in a world that's full of sin, mm -hmm. and that is evil. And so, how do we deal with that on the day to day? And that also does impact our relationships. And so, when you come home in the evening and you and you dealt with some racism, uh, it's it's hard to shake off. Yeah. It's hard to shake off. It's, and then you, if you don't know the tools or how to deal with it, you may take it out on your kids or take it out on your, on your spouse. And so it is a very real thing that we can't just dismiss, as you were saying earlier. Mm, yeah, that's. I thank you for laying that out because that's such a good, um, a, a that's good insight. You can. There's two schools of thought. Just to recap what Gregory said. There's one approach where you're healed, and I love that, and, and that resonates with me. And, and, and then you have the management of it, right. Right. of racism. Those are, those are two beautiful um, um, perspectives, and, and, and thank you for shedding light on that. Um, I want to go back to you, what you said earlier about the, the pendulum swinging with black men and or men. So let me just disclaimer, okay? This show is specifically about black men. We're going to do a show about men, all men, but right now, this is about black men, okay? We don't, we don't leave thank anybody you for out. That. Thank yeah. you for that. And, and, and there's no, and I don't feel like there's a need to apologize for that because mm -mm. I tell you this black men, we want that. I can't tell you how many times black men will specifically tell me i went and i looked for stuff for black men about black men mm -hmm. and we're not there's no help for us yeah there's no one looking just to help us and so this is not to say that white men don't have struggles and issues and no. asian men and and whatever that's true all men have issues but yes. this is such a wonderful thing and i will say this to you too as a woman to say hey i'm here for you brother i want to help you I just gotta say thank you, sis, because we need that and the love that we get from black women, I tell you, it's the sweetest candy on earth. So oh, thank you. Ashe, definitely, definitely, Ashe. Yes, yeah, so this is you know, healing for the culture is all inclusive, but right now we are talking specifically about black men and this show is for black men. Um, and so you talked about the pendulum swinging from either being completely um submissive or or another word you use and then passive. Or being yeah. passive yes and yeah. then being aggressive and then you said but you you have the ability to create your own life and so my question is if you were going to give like just a concrete strategy for a first step for a man to to in particular deal with the mother thing as we have these mother wounds, what would be the, <laughs> the mother wound is real, okay? Yeah. What would be the, like, the first step? To accept that acknowledging your mother's flaws doesn't mean you don't love her or respect her any less. Oh, wow. Acknowledging her for who she is is not disrespecting her. Mm. It's not. It's not. Uh, because you'll hear us cover up for our loved ones yeah. and not make what a big deal it is, is to make what is a big deal not a big deal. Like we may say, you know, 
mom, she has her thing with, you know, she, you know, she smoked a little bit or she did drugs a little bit, you know, she did a little something on the side. We try to cover it up. Say, no, mom was a drug addict. Yeah. Yeah, mom was a drug addict. She, yeah. she was. Or, you know, my mom, you know, from time to time, you know, she'll, she'll say something slick or, you know, something like that. But no, mom was mean. Mm -hmm. Mom was mean. Say mm -hmm. it, call a thing a thing. Yeah. And so, number one is to know that identifying mother's issues is not a form of disrespect. It's just a moment of clarity. Wow. And that's what we're looking for. Mom doesn't have to be perfect for you to love her. You can still love her despite her imperfections. Yeah. And when you are able to really identify what her wounds are, what her struggles are, you're now in a better position to serve her better. Mm. And you can say, here's the deal, Mom. Growing up, you weren't emotionally sensitive. Mom, you did leave us for a drug addiction. You didn't mm. teach me, Mom, how a man should be loved because boys love, boys learn how they should be treated by the way their mothers treat them. Mm. And so, Mom, I got into relationships where women badmouthed me and disrespected me because I thought that's what I deserved. I thought this is how women work. Wow. And so identifying first, first things first. Right. All the same thing. And it's not a form of disrespect to acknowledge that. Oh. And then if your mother, if you're blessed to still have your mother alive, have a conversation with her. Say, Mom, listen, I love you and I want to be here for you. But if here are some things that I think I can help you with, like you helped me with. And see if you're able to now be part of her healing. Mm -hmm. And as she's healing, you both can heal together. Wow. You know, and, and, and that's the one for this. And then also, this is, a, this is, this is it, it may not be, okay, this is a direct line, but a lot of people may not see it as a straight path. Mm -hmm. you, your wife is not your mother, so stop making your wife pay for your mother's debt. Mm. So when your wife has something critical to say to you, that's probably coming from a very loving, nurturing place, but it's still critical. She's not trying to make you an eight-year-old defenseless boy. She's not mm. trying to weaken you. And so when men hear things that are critical from their wives, they tend to go back to this eight-year-old boy Ooh. who was defenseless to defend himself. And that's not your wife's issue, that's your issue that was given to you by your mother, so stop making your wife pay for your mother's debt. Ooh, ooh, that is, oh goodness, I, listen, I'm taking notes. I, I'm taking, I have a notepad family, okay? Because this stuff is just invaluable. Yeah, I yeah, mean, it's yeah. really invaluable, and I think that we don't have we don't have enough brothers really having these conversations. We don't have enough of them. And I do believe that this affects, like you said, our relationships. This affects how we operate in our businesses, how we operate at work, how we interact with the person standing, you know, that we, a stranger in the store. This, how we interact with our friends, this particular, these, these experiences with mothers and these, these traumatic experiences, they infiltrate and permeate and color how we interact and how we show up in the world Absolutely. across the board. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And I often say this, and this for some men that are brought up uh, with mothers, single mothers in particular, we congratulate, we support single mothers as we should. I, in fact, I don't see how single mothers do it. I think Me it is either. probably the hardest job in the world. Yes. I, I do not see how so my hat goes off. But I also right. acknowledge that there's an opposite side of that coin as well, and that is a a a toxic mother is more dangerous than an absentee father. Because with an absentee father, he gives room for another man to step in. Mm. It could be a stepdad, it could be a coach, it could be a pastor, a deacon, a mentor of some sort. But if you're a toxic mother who is present, you're constantly giving your children poison on a daily basis. Oof. And so a toxic mother is more dangerous than an absentee father. Oof. And so we, oftentimes as we grow up, 
because we honor our mothers. So you were the one that was there. You showed up every day. You worked two jobs. You cooked three meals a day. You went to the PTA meetings. Mom, you did it. And we love you for that. And we honor you for that. And we congratulate you for that. But then, Mom, your tongue was poisoned. Mm. And to acknowledge that is not disrespecting your mom. It's, from, it's starting the healing process. Is that there are, that your mother is a woman. She is not God. Ooh. And we sometimes put mothers in like a deity type of uh, role in our yeah. lives. When there are mm. human beings who is flawed, who just try to do their best. Yes. And when we can take mom out of the deity role and look at her as a woman who did her best, yeah. now we can have that healthy relationship that is more balanced. Mm. Where now we can help heal each other. As your mom serves you when you was a child, now as an adult, you can serve her better. Wow. That is deep. That is so deep. And and wow. I I think that what comes to mind for me is compassion. And yeah. and, and yeah. having yeah. compassion for your mother's journey and your and right. your your mother's own story and pain mm. and hurts that she has gone through that she didn't heal from yeah. that she brought to the table with her to raise you. Um, and she put that stuff in your book bag. Yeah. Okay, yeah. it made and you, you happy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and 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 I really I just want to touch on uh, the importance of to your point. Um, calling it out to give it clarity. And I, I teach this a lot. When we shed light on things, it, things that are in the dark are usually uh, we're fearful of and it has so much power because it's in the dark. A lot of times things that are in the dark, that are in darkness, we're fearful of it because we don't know what it is. It's just like when you're in a dark room or you're in a dark, uh, what the, those haunted houses and everything is dark. And it, it's scary because you don't know what's in the dark. <laughs> you know, you don't know what is actually around you until you turn the lights on and you see, oh, it's just make people who are dressed up. Oh, it's nothing. You turn the lights on and you see there's nothing there. Or if there is something there, it's like, oh, it's not as, as scary as I thought it was. Right. And I think that right. when we bring things to light like that, when we shed a flashlight on those things that are in darkness, so the, the, the calling out m the mom and, and, and her behavior and, and how you affected me, we bring that out of darkness and it loses its power. The longer we keep it under the rug, in the dark, the longer we keep it, you know, it, on a top shelf, in a box, in the dark, the more it has power. The longer it has power. And, and, and so, to your point, um, I think that's, that's, that's such, a, such great advice and insight to, to call it out, shed light on it, so that you get clarity and you know how to move. You know what the next step is. Once you get clarity and you see things for what they are, then you can start to strategize and say, okay, this is what this is. All right, what is the next step based on what's in front of me and what I'm dealing with? Right, right. And that, and that also, Ivory, is evolving as we get older because I didn't understand what it was like to be a husband until I became a husband. I didn't know what it was like to be a parent until I became a parent. And so as you get older and you now understand the stresses of marriage or the stresses of parenthood, you are now able to understand your parents better and now you're able to give them more grace because you're because now you can say from experience, I didn't know it was this hard. Yeah. I didn't know you was under this much pressure Woo. seven days a week, 24 hours yes. a day. I mean, you did this all by yourself. Yes. You know? Yes. And so you, now you can understand why, you know, your mom may have lashed out from time to time mm -hmm. because of just the pressure of it. It's hard work. It yes. It's so hard. Yeah. You, you get a But that also doesn't excuse or gives you permission to carry weight that you don't need to carry. Absolutely. Keeping that balance. Keeping that balance. Keeping the balance. And that's the, the emotional maturity 
piece of it. And, and I always say, and, and I, won't, I won't go into this family. This is another show. You know, children, children come here to be teachers for parents. Because when, we, when children get here, who, who, who has to shift their life and their, their daily routines? Parents. Not the child. The child is here to be taken care of. Hey, I'm here. We parents have to make the shift. We p children come here to be the teachers for 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 parents. So um, going back to what you said, you know, making sure that we understand that our mothers are just our mothers. Okay. So I wanna. I, I don't wanna. I don't wanna go into that into that lane, y'all. Into that into that topic because that that'll be off subject. But I just wanted to touch on that. But I do want to go back to your comment. Um, the, when you said stop making your wife pay for your mother's debts, who? Yeah, that yeah. is profound. That is profound. Um, that so touched a nerve. <laughs> that touched a nerve. I, I tell you. So let let me ask you. Can you? And and I think that's important for men to understand. And I think mm -hmm. this. This goes into my next, um, my next question or my next, my next topic or, or what I would like for you to talk about. Just briefly, the importance of, of doing this healing work before you, before you get into relationships with women. I think yeah. men don't, don't value that and they don't understand the value of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well... Uh, oh my God, so much to say about that. Yeah. I think men oftentimes <laughs> rush into relationships because they're trying to nurse a wound that is hurting. Yeah. Mm. And so we're looking for comfort. We're looking for a companion, someone that will make us feel important and valued, like like any normal person would. You know, a good relationship makes you feel good. It makes you feel a greater sense of worth if it's nurturing and loving. But men do it without oftentimes doing their own personal work of am i is this a band-aid for me mm -hmm. or is this an asset for me mm. and so a lot of times men will get into relationships just to put a band-aid over a wound i want to feel better so boom put this on and meet another woman and call her your girl and, and no, not know how to love her correctly but i got a girl she makes me feel good and that's all they know wow instead of doing the work internally and saying, okay, what type of partner do I need that I can be good for and can be good for me? Who us becoming together can make both of our lives better? What can we build together? What type of life can we create together? Uh, men just look for it for more pleasure than they do for building. And that is a sign mm. that a man has not done his work. We have mm. more pleasure seeking than building focus. Ooh. Wow, that sums it up very nicely. You know, I have been seeing just in my social, in my own little bubble, um, yes, in, yes. on social media, I've really been seeing a lot of men who are talking about building. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, to, to your point earlier, people being in quarantine and having time to reflect and be with themselves and maybe not necessarily focus on or or able to to focus on those pleasure principles <laughs> you know because we've been in quarantine um and now there's there's a, a shift or or now there's a a revel you know they see the value in building with a woman yeah. that's yeah. such a such a great point and such great insight because yeah. you get a partner to build with, you know, yeah. be, like at business or any other facet of life. We go to school so we can partner with people so that we can build a, mm. build a better life for us. We go into business with people who have skills that are different for ours so we can build a stronger business. Uh, every partnership should create something that didn't exist before you two or that partnership was created. And mm. so when you're looking at dating, like, <coughs> what can we build together? What can we create together? Wow. Uh, I, not to say that it should be an absence of chemistry. Yes, you want chemistry, but I'm just saying that can't be the primary focus. Mm. It, it's a part of it, yes, but it shouldn't be the focus. The primary focus is what can we do together? How am I making you better? How are you making me better? And, mm. and don't exchange that for just a few moments of pleasure when you can have a lifetime of happiness. Oh, beautiful. 
well said. So if the per other person on the person sitting across from you is not talking about creating and building together, you may be wasting your time. Wasting your time. Yeah. Wasting next. your next. Now yeah. serving ticket number eight sixty three. <laughs> Step <laughs> right exactly. up. Okay. Exactly. Keep it moving, people, ladies and gentlemen. Right. Yes, right. indeed. So. Okay, from a woman's perspective, ladies, this is this is this is for us, okay? So, ladies, we like to get in and, you know, we feel like we can change a man and we can help them heal and you know, we want to do everything. We want to save the world. We want to save our men. And you know, that's just innately and that's just innate in a lot of women. And, and we feel, you know, if we feel like, un until we understand that, you know, w once we get to the point where we mature and we understand that there's only so much that we can do, how, how, how would you say, what's the healthy way for women to support men on their healing journey? Especially, oh, yeah. yeah, we're talking yeah. about like partnerships and relationships, number one. So to speak to that first, and then even talk about like if it's a family member, your brother. Mm, mm. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, I think I think they're both one and the same. I think men universally kind of need uh, a few core things from women or desire a few core things from women. I, I always tell both uh, men and women this: is that if you're in a partnership, if you're in a relationship with someone you don't understand or know who you're with if you don't know two things about that person. Mm -hmm. Number one, what is their biggest dream? And number two, what is their biggest fear? What is their you know biggest the, dream? The biggest, their biggest dream wow. and what's their biggest fear? And so how do you know how to help someone if you don't know what they're aspiring to be? If, they, if God gave them one wish, what would that wish be? Who, what is the legacy they want to leave behind? And so if you really want to support your husband, your brother, your, your son, or your nephew, ask them that and understand what is your biggest dream. If you were to die today, what do you want people to say about you? Mm. And then you be the reminder to him, you are that man. You can be that man. I believe in you. You can be that man in the community that you want to be. You can be that man in the corporate world that you want to be. You can be him. And that will... That reminder from a loving woman in his life motivates him to go after that dream. Wow. So number one, know what his biggest dream is. And then number two, what is his biggest, biggest fear? Uh, that because how can you know how to protect your man if you don't know where he's vulnerable at? Mm. Right? And yeah. so his biggest fear could be to be... Uh, to be left alone, to be lonely, or his biggest fear is to uh, be vulnerable. Show him that you can be safe in front of me. You don't have to fear to be vulnerable, at least in front of me. You know I'm a safe place. I got your back. So if you want to cry, trust me, ain't nobody going to know you cry for just me and you. This ain't going nowhere. I got you. Mm. Let him feel that he can trust you with what his biggest fear is, wow. that he can be vulnerable in front of you, and that he can feel safe sharing with you uh, <clears throat> that vulnerability. And keep that a lot because uh, the Bible tells us that a man rests in his woman's heart. Mm. And so what that means is that a man finds solace and peace in how he trusts his wife or his, or his woman. Yeah. So once that trust has been broken and he doesn't feel he can be vulnerable in front of you ever again, yeah. you've lost him forever. Oh my gosh. He's gone. He's gone forever. At least that one part of him will never return. Wow. That vulnerability will never return. Now, he may show up day to day for performance sake. So he'll buy you flowers for your anniversary, take you out on your birthday, do all the things that a husband's supposed to do, take out the trash, get the oil change. But that's just performance. That's not desire. Mm. Oh, wow. So you got to know his biggest dream in life and what his biggest fear if you're looking to support your man. Now, on, on his journey to healing, whether it be from some type of childhood trauma, mother issues, racism, Whatever, wherever that may be, is to uh, encourage him that it is possible. You don't have to stay here. Yeah. Somebody else has done it. 
hey, so and so wrote a book about it. Oh, look, check out this YouTube video. Mm. It is possible. This can be done. Yes. You don't have to be stuck. Yes. And I think that that is a great support to to every man that is in your life. Wow. Oh my goodness. We have to come back for a part two, Gregory. Okay. We abs. I mean, <laughs> we we're out of. Say. say that again. We got more to say. More to yes, say. we have tons more to say. Wow, family, we have come to the end of the show, and I mean, I always run out of time, but I really ran out of time today, um, because I mean, we could we could we could talk for two more hours about this, because this is such good stuff, and you are a wealth um, of information. You are a jewel. Thank you, thank you, thank you for coming thank on. You. Yes, and imparting so much wisdom and giving us so much insight. Um, and I mean, real, real stuff, not just fluff, not just, you know, it's, it's not macho. It's, it's from a very um, um, true and genuine, authentic space. And I, 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 I really really appreciate that and i'm super grateful to have had you on today um and man thank you for sharing the wisdom with the family today thank you i look forward to coming back we can chat it up some other time absolutely family thank you thank you thank you for tuning in today i hope that you had your notepads because some of this stuff that you've heard today is life-changing I mean I'll, I'll just go ahead and say it it was life-changing for sure um, and, and I know this the reason I know this is because I have conversations with people um, and people just don't know this stuff people don't and I know that the re that the reason that they're they're going in circles and they're that they're on hamster reel, wheels and they keep bumping their heads is because they don't know this kind of information and, and even just knowing how to apply it. So family, thank you again for tuning in to Healing for the Culture. Up next, we have LaCora Monet coming in with Marvelous Minds. So make sure that you all keep it locked, family. And uh, remember, I am just here to peel back the layers for you, family. So go forth peace and abundance to you. Go forth, shine on purpose. I will see y'all next Sunday, same time, same place. Love y'all, family.